Um, this panel uh, focuses on opinion and partisan journalism across borders, and so today we're fortunate to be joined by four experts in the realm of media in, the variety, in a variety of international settings. And this discussion is going to focus uh, broadly on how partisan media are playing a role in the public sphere outside of U.S. borders. I want to give the panelists an opportunity to give us an idea of the meaning and the role of partisan media in the public sphere of their respective areas of expertise before we open up for discussion. Um, but first, I have the honor of introducing our panelists, and I'll start uh, from here moving outwards. Um, Ira Bazin, is, he currently teaches at Ryerson University and the DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. He earned his uh, MA degree at, in American History from UW Madison and joined CBC Radio in 1984. He was senior producer at the Sunday Morning and Quirks and Quarks and was involved in the creation of three network programs. Um, as well as several special series. He's co-author of the Canadian edition of the Book of Lists. Joellen Fair is professor of journalism and mass communication in the School of Journalism and the director of international studies major at the uh, University of Wisconsin. She earned her PhD in mass communication from Indiana University. Uh, her work is international, hum humanistic, humanistic, and interdisciplinary. Thematically, it links journalism, media studies, vi visual culture, popular culture, and social theory. Geographically, it centers on Africa. Uh, Shakuntala Rao is professor of communication and, and journalism at the State University of New York, Plattsburgh. She received her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, Shakuntala's research and teaching interests are in the areas of global media, post-colonial theory, media ethics, and popular culture. Hernando Rojas is an associate professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Wisconsin. He received his uh, PhD in Mass Communication in 2005 from the University of Wisconsin, and his research focuses on public opinion and collective action with an emphasis on new communication technologies and how their deployment can enhance public deliberation. So without further ado, let's get started. Ira? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, it's a delight to be back here in this, um, it's always a pleasure to come back to this great state and to this great university. Uh, I was going to start by, um, I'm the other guy from the CBC here. If you uh, just heard Tony, you know that um, uh, we're very opinionated people. And uh, so I, I just wanted to say at the start that I, I don't speak for anybody uh, except for myself. I, I, uh, and I certainly don't speak for the CBC and, and my opinions that, will, that I'm expressing here are strictly uh, my own. Um, I was going to start, since I studied history here, I thought it'd be appropriate to start by talking a bit of history, but I'm going to drop that because we, we don't have as much time. I, I was going to tell you about the sort of history of partisan media in Canada. And just very briefly, I'll just say this, basically what Jim was talking about um, this morning, only uh, it happened a bit later, that uh, uh, our media originally was, was uh, a very partisan media in the sense that, that our newspapers were owned and controlled by, by political interests, sometimes by commercial interests. And that eventually gave way to an ad-supported, uh, advertiser-supported model. Uh, it happened later than it did here uh, in the uh, um, in the early part of the, in the in the latter part of the 20th century. But it eventually happened. We then evolved into a, a model that that was similar to the uh, United Kingdom in the sense that we have a, uh, a highly regulated broadcast environment and an unreg unregulated print environment. Um, and, uh, but it's different in the U than the UK in the sense that, that our, our print environment is not nearly as, as uh, partisan as it is in the, um, uh, in the UK, although possibly in some cases maybe a bit more partisan than it is in, in the United States in the sense that we have some um, tabloids, uh, uh, a string of tabloids uh, called Sun Media that, that is uh, a highly partisan. Uh, and we have, uh, starting in 1998, Conrad Black, our now disgraced uh, press baron, um, began a newspaper called the National Post, which was specifically uh, designed to, to uh, um, promote his uh, kind of conservative views um, and, uh, and, and bore more relationship to a, to a traditional kind of UK uh, partisan newspaper than it did to, to a Canadian uh, newspaper, so it really kind of shook things up. It never really was all that successful. It still exists today. He obviously no longer owns it. Um, you have to understand what the what the uh, political sort of landscape looks like in in Canada. Uh, we're car currently um, in the middle of a federal election, which is one reason I'm not as organized as I should be because I've been writing about that. Uh, the Conservative Party will likely win the election as they they are currently have been in power for the last five years. 
but it's important to note that, that they will probably win the election with about 37, 38 percent of the, of the uh, vote. Um, the opposition parties, there's three of them that, that skew to the center left, um, will pick up about, you know, uh, uh, between 60 and, and uh, uh, about 55 to 60 percent of the vote. Um, probably my math is wrong. Um, but uh, because, the, because that, the vote will be divided by three parties, they, they won't win the election. The Conservative Party will win the election. The point that I'm making is that there really is not a very large constituency for uh, conservative media, for right-wing media uh, in Canada. Which doesn't mean that, that uh, people aren't going to try that. And what I'm going to talk about today are two uh, kind of recent incidents, one that's still uh, ongoing and one that's been settled, to give you some sense of how Canadians uh, respond to the idea of partisan media, and specifically to the idea of Fox News. Uh, Canadians, um, by and large, are freaked out about Fox News, and freaked out about the, about the potential of Fox News coming to Canada. And what's odd about that statement is almost no Canadians have ever watched Fox <laughs> News. Um, Fox News. Fox News is available. Uh, on Canadian cable, but it's at a fairly high tier, so you have to you know, pay quite a bit in order to get to that tier in, in order to watch Fox News. But even people who have Fox News rarely watch it. Um, you know, their numbers would be almost uh, imperceptible in terms of, of the ratings. What we do watch a lot of is The Daily Show. Um, <laughs> the Daily Show is, is, uh, is available both on cable channel and on, on network television in, uh, in Canada. And, uh, and its numbers are surprisingly large given the time of night. So the view that most Canadians have of Fox News um, comes from the daily evisceration that Jon Stewart gives it. Uh, so that's, that's also an important point to remember when I talk about the fact that Canadian, um, Canadians tend to be freaked out about the, the possible entry of Fox News into Canada. Not Fox News into Canada because it's already there, but a Fox News type station into Canada. And that was really when, when um, uh, Stephen first approached me and, and Wendy about uh, coming here. I was going to talk about um, a new entry into Canadian television called Sun TV News, which was supposed to be on the air, and, and which has been labeled in Canada Fox News North, um, that was supposed to be on the air uh, starting last month. Unfortunately for me and uh, for you, uh, that got delayed and it actually doesn't go on the air till Monday. So the timing isn't quite right, so I can't really tell you uh, what they're going to do. I can only tell you what they're, I can't tell you what they are doing, I can only tell you what they, uh, what they are planning to do. But before I get to that, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the, um, uh, as I said before, the, the broadcast environment in Canada is, is very heavily regulated. Um, it's regulated by a piece of uh, legislation called the Broadcasting Act. And the Broadcasting Act stipulates that programming in Canada must provide a reasonable opportunity for the public to be exposed to the expression of differing views on matters of public concern and serve the needs and interests and reflects the circumstances and aspirations of Canadian men, women, and children, including equal rights to linguistic duality and multicultural and multiracial nature of Canadian society and the special place of Aboriginal peoples within that society. In other words, the central kind of liberal values that, that you know, that. Uh, that, that are at the core of sort of a Canadian political philosophy have to be represented within Canadian broadcasting. The Broadcast Act also says that uh, you are not allowed to broadcast false or misleading news. Now we had an interesting, well it's interesting because you know the American Broadcasting Act uh, says that you can't do that, uh, uh, you, can, you can do that as long as you're not causing pain and suffering to anybody. Um, but the, the uh, well, what's interesting about that is that a couple of months ago there was a, uh, a bit of a controversy stirred up because the Canadian Broadcast Regulator, the Canadian Reg Radio and Telecommunications um, Commission, uh, wanted to eliminate that, that um, provision of uh, um, not being able to broadcast false and misleading news. And why they wanted to do that is actually, there's no conspiracy about it. Um, it's simply that, that uh, a 1992 Canadian Supreme Court ruling um, declared that you could not be charged for disseminating the freedom of the expression included in our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, said that you could not be charged uh, with um, uh, charged for disseminating false information, right? So there, there seemed to be a conflict between, on the one hand, a, in the Broadcast Act saying you cannot broadcast false and misleading information, whereas the Supreme Court had said you cannot uh, um, be charged with uh, the freedom of expression pro uh, provision in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects you uh, if you are uh, simply disseminating false information. 
So there were some people who wanted to eliminate the, the uh, false news provision in the, in the Broadcast Act simply because they thought it was in violation of the, uh, of the charter. This caused a huge uh, stink um, because people thought that this was going to pave the way for the uh, introduction of false news into Canada. Um, one uh, commentator, uh, so the CRTC asked for people to comment on, on uh, this, this possible change and said, one commentator said, if implemented, this change will throw wide the door throw wide the doors to the lies and manipulation of Fox News style television. If implemented, this change will usher in an era in which venomous fact issuing news media will shape the destiny of Canada. Gives you an idea of the sort of opinions there. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, wrote in the Huffington Post that um, political dialogue in Canada is marked by civility, modesty, honesty, collegiality, and idealism that have pretty much dis disappeared on the U.S. Air airwaves. Uh, this was in a post on the Huffington Post um, uh, uh, urging Canadians not to do away with the false and misleading news provision of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Broadcast Act. In fact, they, they decided they were just, after all this sort of fuss, they just decided, well, we won't bother going there, and so the false and misleading news provision is still within the, the Broadcasting Act. Second, so that's, that's one example of, of how uh, Canadians are, are sort of freaked out about, about Fox News. The second example is the, is the um, introduction of this new channel, Sun TV News, uh, which has been labeled Fox TV New, uh, North. Um, it was, uh, it's the brainchild of, of the Sun Media Corporation, which is owned by a guy named Pierre-Marc Pellido, who's based in Quebec, um, who owns a series of, of uh, tabloid newspapers, owns uh, uh, cable stations, owns the... Um, a, uh, uh, owns the telephone telephone company uh, in um, in Quebec, and he is a, a fairly conservative guy. You can think of him as a, a young uh, sort of Rupert Mur Murdoch kind of guy. Um, he uh, had this idea that he would um, start this new television station uh, called Sun TV News. I'll give you the uh, here's some of the things that they've been saying. This this is from their. Uh, um, CEO, who also happens to be the former communications director of the Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, uh, who's now Quebecor uh, media vice president. He says, we're taking on the mainstream media, we're taking on smug, condescending, often irrelevant journalism, we're taking on political correctness, we will not be state broadcast or offering boring news by bureaucrats for elites and paid for by taxpayers. We will be unapologetically patriotic. We will offer the type of raw debate that Canadians only find today in coffee shops and around the dinner table. Sun News will be controversially Canadian. CBC News Network and CTV News, those are two main channels, have failed to win over Canadians despite their obvious advantage of incumbency. Canadian TV news is narrow, is complacent, it's politically correct, it's bland, and it's boring. Our aim is not to bore people to death. We'll leave that to the CBC. Um, <laughs> so the, they make no bones about what, what it is they're, they're planning to do. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, as with uh, Fox, the, the idea is to have hard news in the daytime and then opinion uh, um, in the evening. Um, there was a, uh, uh, a tremendous backlash uh, about the um, uh, application for Fox News. I'll, I'll just see if I can find this quickly. Yes, so, so a petition uh, was, uh, was uh, circulated uh, online called Stop Fox News North. Uh, it got tens of thousands of people who signed on it, including uh, Margaret Atwood. The petition said, Prime Minister Harper is trying to push American-style hate media onto our airwaves and make us all pay for it. His plan is to create a Fox News North to mimic the kind of hate-filled propaganda with which Fox News has poisoned U.S. politics. The channel will be run by a former Harper top aide and will be funded with money from our cable TV funds. Um, that, had, that related actually to, to a controversy over where on the dial uh, Fox News was going to be. Fox News begins, uh, sorry, Sun News TV, uh, Freudian slip, Sun News TV begins, begins on uh, Monday. I doubt it will be very successful because, as I say, I don't think that, that um, uh, there is a constituency, a large enough constituency for, for a conservative uh, kind of broadcasting in, in uh, Canada. I don't think it will be well enough funded. Uh, Pelado says he's going to spend $100 million over the next five years. That's only $20 million a year, which is not enough to run a, a, a respectable uh, news organization, particularly in a country as large as Canada. And thirdly, I believe that, that, that um, that in terms of partisan media, the well has been poisoned sufficiently in Canada because of our perception, however um, 
accurate or inaccurate, uh, about what Fox News represents, that um, the Canadians in general, I think, are very wary about, about the idea of, of uh, allowing our media, which has traditionally been, our broadcast media, which has traditionally been relatively nonpartisan, to turn that into a more, uh, uh, move in that direction of a more partisan media. I just want to make note that um, with reference to uh, the Sun News TV, uh, Ira had a, a quick clip that he wanted to show, but given the time constraints, we're going to put it on the blog so that it's available for your reference. Yeah, it's just their promotional video, which will give you an idea of what it is that they're planning to do. Joella? Um, I'm going to actually have to sort of read my presentation because I was coming home from a conference yesterday and there were many, many airport delays and I'm extremely tired and my memory is the first thing that goes when I'm extremely tired, so I decided to write something down. Um, I'm going to talk about Africa. Um, Africa is a continent of 54 states, all with great diversity, so it's hard to address partisanship of media in Africa when there are so many different histories, different political and economic realities, and scores and scores of cultural, linguistic, regional, religious communities within each state. To talk about partisan media, especially in comparison to the United States, is to make certain assumptions about the workings of liberal democracy and the normal workings of media. In the United States, for a long stretch of our history, encompassing most of the 20th century, we have convinced ourselves that an unbiased, objective press was ideal and, and achievable. In much of Europe, this illusion has never been harbored. Democracy was and is seen to gather strength from strident and partisan media. As a colonial project, the press in Africa, British, French, German, Belgian, Portuguese, adopted partisanship, supporting or opposing certain policies, conservative or liberal, in the colony. When Africans began to, to use the press to mobilize independence movements, European powers were a little less enthralled with the partisan media. And of course, the reason many authoritarian African governments insisted on complete control of media from independence in the late 1950s and early 1960s through the 1980s was because they all knew very well that an unfettered press would be critical, would be partisan, would take sides. Since the early days of, of independence, African states have experimented, not always very successfully, with democracy. Certainly since the 1990s, the people of many or even most African countries have established democracy. Over, all over the continent, there has been a corresponding growth of civil society actors, including news organizations, advocating setting the stage for democracy. Though democracy has grown in the countries of Africa since the 1990s, tensions between government and media persist, and I'll return to those. But let me come back to my point that to talk about partisan media, one must look at the assumptions made about the functions of a liberal democracy and whether those ideas and ideals can be injected into Africa. Under liberal democracy, the individual is perceived and treated as an autonomous agent. People are encouraged to be citizens of the country first and foremost, to participate in national culture, and part of that participation is the simple act of voting. Other identities or solidarities racial, religious, linguistic, cultural, are tolerated, maybe even encouraged, to the extent that they don't interfere with national civic citizenship. Here in the United States, news media are expected to surveil government and society at large, to be objective, disinterested, balanced, and fair in gathering, processing, and dissemination of news. The assumption, of course, is that since people have equal rights as citizens, the media should be accessible and nonpartisan. And that's the model of liberal democracy that the United States, international organizations and donors have been and are continuing to export to African states. It's the vision of liberal democracy that has come to be espoused by most African countries. It's the model that election monitoring groups look for. It's the model that's taught in countless journalism training workshops, many of which I've participated in. And African governments, Civil society and news organizations all do a nice wink and nod and go along with these principles of liberal democracy and government press relations. It's lovely and it's quite false. The rhetoric of democracy in Africa and of government press relations may resemble the US version, but that's not the practice. In the African context, 
How we understand the purpose, function, and operation of the press depends on what democratic model we're actually drawing from. When talking about democracy in Africa, one has to acknowledge the importance of cultural identity, multiple solidarities, communalism, communitarianism, whatever you want to call it, but the sense of belonging to multiple, to multiple cultural groups. And of course, this is true in the United States and in other regions of the world as well, but multiple political and social allegiances are especially pronounced in Africa, where the state is young and typically does not correspond with cultural allegiances going back any great length of time. Liberal democracies focus on the rights of individuals within a state to which all owe allegiance cannot and does not reflect Africans' lived social, political, and, and experiences. And thus there is heavy pressure on journalists to straddle and reconcile individual rights born of liberal democracy with group rights born of African social relations, with the loyalties that individuals feel towards region, religion, ethnicity, kin group, family. African journalists lead double lives. They talk the talk of, lo of liberal democracy, and they walk the walk of the reality of group solidarities, interests, and demands. Is this partisanship? I don't know. I wonder whether the concept of partisanship in African media makes a lot of sense, just because just about everybody in African countries balances multiple loyalties. And journalists have to speak to, and yes, speak for, uh, some of these loyalties. It would be impossible to do otherwise. The concept of partisanship that we use in this country implies contestation over the best way to make policy in a, in a state to which, all, to which all citizens ultimately owe final loyalty. What does partisanship mean uh, in a situation where there is not a clear loyalty one owes to the state vis-a-vis -vis other loyalties? Certainly government media think all opposition media are partisan. They label them that way. And certainly opposition media think government media are partisan. But journalists in Africa continually find themselves butting up against the reality that the state is far from the only political ent entity to which audiences give loyalty. The global conversation, the global discourse about media increasingly assumes one kind of liberal democracy and one standard set of relationships between journalists and the state, ranging from adversarial to supportive, but always along that same axis. But African journalism does not fit well into this discourse because media consumers in Africa are simultaneously worried about family, group, regional, religious, and ethnic identities and issues at least as strongly as about national ones. The poor journalist, wedded by government and civil society to a certain view of liberal democracy and a certain view of state press relations, but who can really not work outside of group ties, be they family, kin, ethnic, religious, or regional, suffers regular cognitive dissonance. In the world of the African journalist, collectivities in the sense of belonging to, uh, belonging to sub-state groups trump liberal democracy's stress on individual versus the state. Always. Paradoxically, belonging to multiple groups maximizes individual opportunities in ways that liberal democracy cannot ever do for, for Africans. And in an era of global uncertainty, that's reassuring. Group identity gives Africans what anthropologist James Ferguson calls a full house of cultural strategies that make getting by in uncertain circumstances manageable. Journalists, too, have learned strategies to get through the careful negotiation of individual and group rights. So long as government, civil society, and the media keep, that charade, keep up the charade that liberal democracy in, in the Western mode is functioning here, there will be tensions, claims of partisanship, hypocrisy, and double standards. Liberal democracy is a powerful orthodoxy. We wring our hands over the problem of partisan journalism. I'm not sure whether that anxiety about partisan journalism in the, in the U.S. is about the in-your-face aspect or more about the media's representation of the interests and claims of groups. But perhaps what we are seeing is the balancing act that African journalists have done over the past 50 years, 
navigating between individual and group rights. Perhaps what we're seeing is the Africanization of the American press. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joellen. Um, Um, when Stephen called me a couple of months ago and asked me to talk about partisan politics um, in media in India, I was scratching my head because, and so he's also threw in Pakistan in there as well. So, and, I was, and I'm still scratching my head because I'm not sure if I can fit in the discussion of partisan politics, what I've been listening today all day, into what has happened in India for the last 20 years. I know people have been reading about, you know, the rise of India, Chindia, really, that we, in New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, just everybody's talking about the story of the new millennium. Um, in fact, not that anybody wants to hear a quote from Rupert Murdoch, um, but he came to India a couple of years earlier, and he was asked about the rise of India, and he said, really, I don't think um, media, if I'm exactly saying his words, um, but something in the order that uh, we are no longer talking about the rise of India or it's tomorrow is India, tomorrow, tomorrow is India. So we're no longer talking about this um, story yet to be told, it is the story. So if this is the case, um, I mean, why did he come to that conclusion? Um, India in the last 20 years has seen uh, massive deregulation, privatization of the broadcast industry, what has resulted has been the third largest television uh, viewing nation in the world. And I think it will be the second largest within the next week, um, given our population. Um, what, I, I really think there's some, this is, I think this is the story that we need to talk about. And among ethicists like me, I think it's a story that needs to be looked, both celebrated and looked at with some level of skepticism. We have 120 uh, new news channels that have come up in the last uh, decade, um, broadcasting in more than 20 different languages. So we really have uh, an explosion of a kind that probably hasn't been seen in broadcast or cable television history. So I think if, if we take that into account, of course, the question is, just because we have a lot of competition, we have a lot of um, uh, news, does that mean it's, it's quality journalism? And I think that's the question for us people who study uh, jur journalism scholars in India. I think that is, that is our imminent question. Um, just like American uh, Broadcasting has been has been called, and you know, sort of there's been people have said the foxification of news, and there's been a lot of talk about that. We have seen a similar trend called what we call the starification of news, also thanks to News Corporation, uh, which started its first uh, cable television, cable news television in India called Star News. And the focus of Star News from its very inception in the early 1990s was what we call the three C's of Indian news, cricket, cinema, and crime. And, that, and it's worked really well. I mean, those three areas is widely broadcast. Any, any, at any t channel, you will know about all the Bollywood stars, their horoscope, when they're getting married. Um, usually they stay married, and if they had any affairs, you know, all that, all that stuff is, is broadcast 24-7. Uh, and of course, then of course, the next question would be, what about public service journalism? We have the globalization of you know, Indian media. Um, and, uh, but that's where I think Indian broadcasting and cable television has really not taken off. And I actually place that uh, not necessarily on the practices of journalism, but to understand from our perspective, it's a relatively, it's a brand new profession. It's an entirely new profession. The ethics have to be um, invented within the Indian scenario. I'll give you a very good example of what happened to me um, last year. Um, I was invited to sort of kind of, kind of have a talk with professors, some of the colleagues um, at Indian Institute of Management Studies, which has a journalism school. It's, it was started about two years ago. It's a relatively new journalism school. Um, there are journalism schools cropping up in India every day. Um, so there, because, because there's such a high demand for journalism professional training, it's, it's a new, naturally given the, the newness of the profession. And I go in there, and one of my colleagues comes in and said, you know, you, I'll introduce you to the dean. So, you know, I, I'm, I work at an American university, so I know, you know, the dean usually is somebody who who's been in the profession for a long time, and you know, kind of he or she 
she has been in the profession for a long time, is an administrator, so you know, I sort of feel, okay, I'm gonna meet the dean. This guy walks in, he's about 27 years old, maybe 28, and he shakes my hand, he said, you know, I'm the dean of the school, and you know, I would like you to, and I'm sort of just, not because of age, I mean, partly because of age, I'm quite stumped at this point that the dean of a college is this very young person. Uh, but given the scope of the Indian broadcasting and cable experience, he already had seven years of experience, which is very long. So in that sense, what we have really is a dearth of education, journalism education, which leads to, which has led to a kind of, you know, a, a, a culture right now where we have a lot of information entertainment. There's also a lot of information about corruption. There's, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of discussion about political corruption. But, that, but, but the fact that we need a public service journalism, a journalism that is dedicated to investigative reporting is only now taking shape, and I think I think it'll take another 20 years before we have those practices in place. In fact, the first broadcast ethics codes are being written right now. So this is the first time we will have ethics codes for television. Now, which is not to say that India hasn't had a very long history of uh, an open print media. That has, that has been, and that has actually helped in some ways for this broadcasting industry to take off. But as we know, those are two, still two different animals. And we can't just take, take print media journalists and put them into broadcasting. It hasn't, in some cases it's worked, some cases it hasn't worked. So I think what we are seeing is truly a journalism in transition. Um, and I, of course, we, what we want ultimately is for that journalism in transition to strengthen our democratic institution. What we don't want is our democratic institutions to weaken because of this new form of journalism. I'll stop here and any questions I'll answer them. Thank you. Actually, when, when Steve invited me to participate in, in, in this, I, I was very hesitant, and, and, I, and I'm still a little hesitant because the story that I'm going to tell you is quite different from what we've been hearing all day, and it's related to, I'm going to argue that in Colombia's media system today, has never been less partisan and has never been more professional than it currently is. That doesn't mean it's a great media system. It's largely deregulated media system. It largely depends on a advertisement and it is very close to business interests. But when you look at the history of Colombia during the early 20th century, what you find is a very polarized country along liberal and conservative lines and a very polarized media among liberal and conservative lines. And when I say a very polarized, I am euphemistically talking about an undeclared civil war that between the beginning of the century uh, till the late 50s was going on between liberals and conservatives in Colombia. And so newspapers at the time were either liberal papers or conservative papers. In part because of the solution elites found for this recurring a conflict which was to create a national front in which they alternated power every four years for 20 years. So there would be a liberal government followed by a conservative government followed by another liberal government in which of course any liberal policy was then taken back by the conservative government and then any conservative policy was then taken back by the liberal government that followed. So there was a huge defense of the status quo and of course for media, well, identifying then with liberals or, 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 or conservatives made no sense anymore. At the same time, there were other factors, professionalization, universities, etc. But by the end of this, by and large, by the, by the end of the, the by middle 70s, by the end of the National Front, it, media, and it, it, this is actually, a, there's a famous quote from one of the editors of the biggest newspaper in Colombia, El Tiempo, that said, look, we're not liberal media, we're not conservative media, we are government media. What, whoever is in government, we are aligned with whoever is in government. That's our editorial policy. Uh, this is less the case today. Media has gained independence. Uh, it's not perfect independence, but it has gained independence. It has gained professionalism. And so this brings me back to the problem of, okay, so there's less partisanship in Colombian media today than there used to be, and there's more professionalism. And so how can I fit this with the topic of the conference. And, 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 and it, I found out how persuasive Steve is, and so I'm here. 
<laughs> but, but beyond that, it, it, there's an interesting aspect that hasn't been touched on today, which is the relationship between public opinion, partisanship among public opinion, and perceptions of media. And one thing that my research finds in Colombia, and I don't have a lot of, I, I can only go back to 2006 when, when, when I first started collecting data in Colombia, but if I compare, for example, 2006 and 2010, not a, not a large time period, but I find that even though media are better today than they were before, people perceive media to be more biased today than they perceive them to be in the past. And so what I would like to argue, and this is sort of the, 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 the spin that I'm bringing to our conversation, is that on the one hand, we talk about media, we, we talk about partisan media, but we also have to think about a partisanship and rise in partisanship among political constituencies. And this can bring us back then to the US case. A, a colleague in political science, Shanta Weingar, argues that today in the US, people are more worried about their son or daughter marrying somebody from the opposite political party than somebody from a different religion, which was not the case 30 or 40 years ago. And so then the big question then that I'm posing to my fellow colleagues and, and yourself is, is, okay, so how much of the Pew, the, the, that Pew statistic that opened uh, Jim Mothman this morning when he talked about, okay, so people distrust media, people see media as biased, but how much of that is perceptions of bias of the public of media and not real bias? And I'll finish off by saying that there's a long tradition within editors, and, and we've heard it a couple of times already today, if we're pissing both sides of the issue, we're doing our job right. In academic circles, we call that the hostile media effect, a more pompous term, but to describe something similar in which we say, hey, most partisans tend to think that media are biased against them and, and favoring the other side. And so then the question is, or the problem that I pose is that when we think about people and their understanding of media coverage, we also have to be wary about people's polarization. And it poses, I think, a huge challenge to us as journalists and as academics in terms of, so what do we do? Do we follow people in their polarization and do we become more polarized? But if we do that, how does that serve our conception of democracy and as a place of public deliberation or a public pay? place where people come together to talk about different ideas. I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, um, so I'll hold mine and, and offer you the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. Alternatively, I will ask my question. <laughs> There's a question. Um, I, oh, sorry, please. I was just wondering if you would talk more about the hostile media effect, what you mean by that. It, well, it, there, there's, there's a tradition in, in psychology that says that most, most of the time when somebody interprets a text, they will find things in that text that demonstrate that their position is the true opinion, is the right position, is the correct opinion. But interestingly, when it comes to media, we tend to do the opposite. We interpret a media text to be biased against it. So a, a media, particularly if you're a partisan. So somebody that's encountering an article, and there's been tons of experiments that have been conducted in which you construct an article as balanced as you can. You submit it to panels of experts to look at it and try to make it as balanced as you can. So with the luxury of time that journalists sometimes do not have, and, and you come up with this piece of reporting that is actually as fair and balanced as it can get, it, you give this to partisans and both sides on that issue will say, this is biased and it's biased against me. So we, 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 we sort of disassociate with our, ourselves from that content and find that, number one, it's gonna sway public opinion against us. Number two, it may, and this is also something that my research shows, it makes us want to correct. And so you'll find, not surprisingly, that in online forums, in newspapers, when you host an online forum or when you let people comment the news, well, there's a lot of people that are trying to correct on both sides because they're both seeing that argument or that, that, that news article as biased um, against their view. And so this has led to some people to talk about, is it biased news or biased public? Uh, 
Um, Professor Rao, um, how logistically, how are people tuning into 120 different news networks <laughs> and is that creating polarized communities more so than we have here in the United States? Right, right. It, you know, that's a very good question. First of all, I do want to say that, um, sort of just thinking about what Andre is saying here, um, I also do want to say that, it, number one, in response to your question first, which is, the, um, in India, the, there hasn't been a real uh, discussion about audience feedback. Right. Um, only now, th there is such a system called TRP, which is sort of somewhat similar to the rating system here, but it's in its infancy, really. Uh, it's, been, it's being developed right now. Interestingly, Nielsen's is the one that's sort of gone in there, and they have set up their Nielsen India firm right next, two years ago. So they are actually trying to replicate some of the, what they have been able to do, uh, particularly in Middle East um, and, and, and China. So there's an experiment going on there to get audience feedback. So we really don't know when we have 120 news channels is what kind of audience fragmentation or a kind of who's demographic. We haven't been able to really figure this one out well, right? Um, but I think it, your second part of your question is if we have seen a polarization, and that's a very good question. Some of the journalists that I talked to have said um, all these news channels has not really created a diversity. If anything, it's created enormous uh, differences uh, based on religious politics. So really, um, in India, when we talk about partisan politics, and that's why I can, when Stephen asked me, I was like, should I, you know, is, are we really talking about partisan politics? Or are we really talking about religious politics, right? So we actually, when, you know, when a native like me goes back, I know exactly what the religious politics of a news channel is, right? You sort of kind of, you realize that within a few moments, except for the English channel, where you know that it's going to be a much more secular discussion. So um, that's, that's an important question. I don't I don't think those answers have been figured out yet because of the, the, the newness of the television media. Uh, but I think, you know, I think there's been a lot of discussion about social media in the United States and stuff. What I think what really needs to be studied is what's going on with television and how it's impacting these sort of, you know, emerging nations and emerging uh, countries. So I think, um, I, th I think that that is the question of the day, is are we creating globalization or are we creating hyper-localization than ever before? Um, Mr. Bazin, um, I, I did not know even that there was a Canadian election, which I think points out to some of the uh, problems of our own media. A lot of Canadians How are trying to ignore it as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> How, do you have a theory as how we can as Americans consumers, ask for and get more information about our neighbors? About Canada? Canada. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it's now, you, you can, you know, wake up in the morning and listen to the local tel uh, Toronto radio station and find out what the traffic is like on the Don Valley Parkway. I mean, you know, the, the internet has, has made that available to you. I don't think, I mean, and this has to do also with what Tony was, was saying. I mean. If you're not going to cover what's happening in the Middle East, which has a, an enormous impact, direct impact on American life, you're probably not going to send correspondence to Canada because nothing we do really, well, not very much of what we do has, has that great an impact on you. So I think that's not going to be, that's not how it's going to happen. If you want to find out more about what's happening in Canada, you're not going to be able to do it through American media. But, you know, because of the web, you do have opportunities to find out, uh, you know, through Canadian media that's available to you cbc.ca slash news would be one thing to do. Um, and, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's something that, you know, you're going to have to take responsibility to do it because it's not going to happen the other way around, I don't think. Um, Professor Rayo, I know that the first broadcast ethic codes are being written. Uh, on what basis are we using, are, are they being developed? What, what do you mean the basis? I mean, what's the need or? No, no, okay. what, what are they being based on, literally? It, are, are they using Western codes, American broadcast codes? Or? Right. Um, actually, in India, there's a there's a lot of sense about sort of the, the localization of Indian codes, right? There's a lot of. I'm not sure I am that invested in it, but I think that there is definitely the sense that um, codes have to have the Indian touch, right? Um, that was mentioned when I was last year I was talking to the, to the head of the Indian Press Council, uh, which is not involved in the writing of these codes. Interestingly, uh, this, the, this particular code is being written mostly by broadcasters, private broadcasters, private 
cable operators and broadcasters. So this does not involve the government in any way. In fact, they don't want any of the government entities to be involved in the writing of this code. So they, they've been very clear about that. Um, I actually don't know if there is particularly a great sense of um, let's look at all the world's ethics codes and, and come up with something, but there is definitely a sense that let's see what are the larger democracies, what they're doing, sort of comparable democracies, um, uh, th what they're doing and what their codes are. And some of that information, I think, will appear in the new, in the set of codes that are being worked on right now. Um, a lot of Indian journalists um, kind of um, also depend on the codes that Press Council of India published. Right now, I think that's the dominant code um, that was published um, in the late 50s and have, has been updated since, right? Which sort of deals with particularly Indians, particularly unique Indian situations. For, for instance, how to represent religious groups, right? Gender issues. So those are the things that I think will reappear, I think, in this particular code. So I think we'll see, again, a localization of maybe some global codes. During the keynote uh, lecture, we heard a little bit about um, the difference between Al Jazeera and Fox News and the mechanisms that, that are in place in the UK for um, complaints about uh, you know, ethics code violations and um, people who might be enraged by particular coverage. Can you talk about your respective countries and um, the ways in which or the kinds of mechanisms that are in place for citizens to push back when uh, partisan media or, or, or media more broadly sort of violates uh, norms or standards or codes of ethics or, or even misrepresents perspectives. Um, I know, for example, uh, you mentioned the CBC um, sort of inviting conversation from, from the population. I'd like to hear um, about your respective countries and those mechanisms. I mean, in Canada, I mean, the CBC does have a, an ombuds person, um, which not very many, I think only two or three broadcast outlets in, in Canada do, or newspapers even, have, have uh, ombuds, as they call them. Um, and, and, uh, but, and we have a, a you know, broadcast council, but I think one of the interesting things about um, the Sun TV North, um, uh, sorry, Sun TV News, Fox News North, uh, will be um, whether they are able, I mean, given the orientation that, that they have, uh, and given the fact that the Broadcast Act says that, that um, you are not allowed to, to broadcast false or misleading news, and that, that, the, the, uh, um, that the Broadcast Act also says that, that you know, the reporting has to be within the sort of Canadian sort of norms, Canadian values, what will happen if they, they start to run up against that and if, if citizens begin to start complaining um, about that and whether it is a violation of the, of the Broadcasting Act, because that's never really, I don't think, ever been, been tested in, in Canada, um, whether, whether uh, news reporting is, is actually um, in violation of, of the Broadcast Act, and that'll be something that'll be interesting to see. Well, uh, being mostly a private system, I, I, I think there's three possibilities. One, of course, is going online and commenting and expressing your views, mostly in this reactive fashion that I've been talking about, trying to correct the position that the paper is seen to be mistakenly taken. Uh, there's systems of ombuds people uh, that I think are mostly decor decorative in most of these mm -hmm. uh, media institutions. And then, of course, there would be legal resources in terms of libel law and things like that. Um, well. As a continent, I'm, I'm, I can't do all 54 uh, <laughs> countries. Um, but um, in general, there are very often uh, in countries what have been established that are called national media commissions. And if somebody has a complaint about how something was covered, uh, they can take their complaint to the national media commission, which will then uh, investigate um, the complaint, investigate the, you know what, how the sources were used, the, the slant of the story, and so forth. And sometimes that means uh, nothing happens, and sometimes it means that the journalist and the aggrieved party will get together to talk about uh, what should happen and what would be the proper um, sort of uh, uh, remedy or relief to, to, to the grievance. Um, of course, there are libel laws, um, and in many countries, criminal libel now is gone. So there's just uh, the, 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 
the civil libel laws that are, but those are not used all that often. It, the preference is typically through these national media commissions. But to, to touch on something that Hernando just said is that um, the diaspora online press is incredibly important uh, and increasingly important uh, about taking on uh, national news stories, you know, Ghana, Liberia, in many, many countries and really pressing journalists in those countries to uh, push further into investigating, or uh, a lot of times uh, from the diaspora, so from Canada or from the US or from the UK or from France, uh, people are writing their own stories, doing their own investigations, and trying to push reporters in the domestic setting to uh, you know, do a little bit more reporting, to go out uh, a little bit further in, in terms of what they're willing to say. Do you think that the uh, press is responsive to the, I'm thinking about in the US, um, for example, people go on comment boards on CNN, people put up their websites and they have things to say and it, it, sometimes the press is responsive. Um, and well, well this, is, not. this is not done on a, on a news site, it's done on a diaspora mm -hmm. community's mm -hmm. news site. So they're not going to a newspaper or a television station and posting things on their news site. They are posting their own stories on their own sites and then perhaps sending it to journalists or sending it to uh, the news organizations uh, for their comment. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think in the, from the journalists I've talked to, in some sense there's tremendous relief because finally a story can be told and uh, it can be followed up upon and um, they didn't have to do it. In India, usually we do it the Indian way. You take a little sign and show up in front of the newspaper's office and you go on a hunger strike. I mean, that is not uncommon. That happens. You visit Times of India, Hindustan Times, NDTV. There's always a tent. They keep a tent out there. It's a very vocal democracy. People are heard. And the tents, and so I actually went into one of the tents and I said, well, what is that for? I said, it's for all the people who come from the rural areas outside of the city to come and register their complaints. Many of them have watched the news. They don't know how to read and write, so you have to send a journalist out there or one of the employees who will listen to what they have to say and write it down and bring it back inside for the editorial board. So um, it's a very, there's that face-to-face -face communication that takes place even in the very smallest of newspapers, what we call kasbas, um, in mohallas, in small towns, editors have told me that, they, that their readers or viewers will, will get their voice to them. Whether personally, in India, I think that's the common form of communication. You don't write a letter to the editor. You show up to see the editor. So in fact, editor has open hours, or you know, he has this big bullhorn that he goes out there, and he or she is sort of talking to all the people who have come out there to see him. I mean, on a regular basis, especially in small newspapers, they're not really particularly small. Some of them can be a million and a half uh, readership. Um, so th the people from faraway places will take a bus to come and talk to the editor. That is not unusual. So in that sense, I, I think India is at the forefront of that kind of democratic dialogue, but we also have a long history of that dialogue now. So it's definitely there's a dialogical process. We are out of time. Thank really? you very much, panelists. Thank you. Bye.